Okay, welcome to the second lecture. Uh, we're going to go really quickly and finish some of the basics and trends. I don't want to spend a lot of time on these because some of these are known to some of you. Uh, if, if, you, if you need to, uh, if you need to uh, learn more about the basics, you can definitely uh, go through the slides yourselves. Okay, this is where we are. We're still continuing the trends and basics, more basics right now. We talked about multiple banks and channels, remember? This is so fundamental, multiple banks. Basically, they enable concurrent DRM accesses. We talked about the notion of interleaving that also reduces latency. So this is good for many things, actually. Uh, and the bits in the address determine which bank and address resides, resides in. Multiple independent channels in memory serve the same purpose, uh, except they're even better, perhaps, because they have separate data buses. It increases the bus bandwidth. But, uh, of course, if you have multiple channels, you need to have more pins. That's the downside. And enabling more concurrency requires reducing uh, bank conflicts and channel conflicts. And this is something that you will see in any kind of parallel system. In fact, uh, banks, as we discussed, the idea of banks were developed to uh, supply data to vector processors, essentially. And uh, whenever you have a lot of uh, accesses to memory, you, need to, you have conflicts to banks and channels and you need to reduce them. GPU programming, getting, getting good performance out of GPU is all about uh, getting higher memory bandwidth by reducing these conflicts. Now there's a lot of literature on reducing conflicts, which I'm not going to cover. I'll give you a couple of ideas. Basically. How do you, uh, one idea could be how do you select or randomize a bank or channel indices in the address? Uh, lower order bits usually have more entropy and you can select those. There's this ringing still. You can select those uh, to decide which bank an address maps to. Or you could use randomizing hash functions. You can XOR the addresses of different, uh, XOR the different address bits so that you select which bank an address maps to. Okay, how multiple banks help? So this is what happens when you have uh, no, uh, no banks or a single bank. Basically, uh, these accesses to different addresses are conflicting in the bank. As a result, you wait for the full bank access latency. If you have multiple banks, you can uh, send requests to different banks in a pipeline manner, assuming they map to different banks. Right? That's the key. But how do you ensure that they map to different banks? One idea could be in software, you reorganize your code and data such that accesses go to different banks. This may not be that easy because usually in software you don't have that much visibility into the memory system. That's, the, that's a big downside actually in today's memory systems. That's why we should be rethinking some of the memory system also. How do you expose the memory system better to the software such that software can do better optimization? This is unfortunately, it's, it's not been done for decades and decades. It's sad, right? <laughs> that's why we need to change the mentality. That's this, this lecture is all about mentality a little bit. Uh, or you actually do some tricks like this. Uh, may, maybe in hardware you select different bits. So there are two types of address mapping in hardware that are dominant today in a single channel. I'm not going to go through the numbers over here, but one is row interleaving. You have consecutive rows of memory uh, in physical memory uh, that are mapped to consecutive banks. So basically get two, kilo, two kilobyte chunks, for example. Uh, you map this two kilobytes to bank zero, next two kilobytes to bank one, dot, dot, dot. Now this is good for streaming accesses, for example, right? Because you can stream through the row buffer of a single bank. Or you could do a cache block interleaving. Consecutive cache block addresses are in consecutive banks. Cache block zero is in bank zero, cache block one is bank one, cache block two is bank two, dot, dot, dot. Again, this is good for parallelism uh, for accessing consecutive cache blocks. You can access two, consecu two consecutive cache blocks from two different banks or channels. You can, you can apply the same thing I said to channels also, certainly. So in, in many uh, systems today, there's some randomization that happens to the address bits. Uh, for example, the memory controller takes some of the address bits and XORs them to some, of the, some other address bits to get the to get which bank the address actually maps to. And this is done to minimize uh, bank conflicts as much as possible as far as the hardware designer is concerned. This may or may not be a good thing. This also adds uh, an extra la layer. Uh, if, you, if you cannot decode this, you don't know what, where, where your address is mapped to, right? But these functions, people are reverse engineered them. And if you're really interested in understanding how randomization reduces bank conflicts, there's this beautiful paper by Bob Rao uh, who actually worked on a lot of VLIW processors uh, at HP Labs at the time. Uh, he uh, talked about how to randomize the index function to memory such that you get much lower bank conflicts in vector processors and VLIW processors. This is one of the seminal papers. There is work before that also that are really interesting. That's work references, so you can take a look at that. So address mapping is a huge problem actually. If you have multiple channels, let's say you have two channels, 
you need to select which bit uh, determines in the address uh, which channel the address maps to. It could be here, it could be here, it could be here, it could be here, or it could be anywhere in between actually. It leads to different conflict patterns uh, at the software level, clearly. And you can answer the question where are the consecutive cache blocks if you have that. And this is uh, the example with C bit somewhere in the middle over here. So basically this is, this is something that's not easy to do, I think, in current systems. And even harder to reason about at the software level because these, this information doesn't get exposed to the higher levels. Today, the software has no idea about the topology of uh, DRAM that we've discussed earlier. Like, where, is it, where does an address get gets mapped to? You don't really, really know, right? Unless you reverse engineer the entire thing. But reverse engineering is also costly, so we need better interfaces if you want software to take full advantage of the memory system. And the hardware needs to provide some information, oh, this is my mapping, and the software needs to be able to control that information. So, so far we said hardware doesn't provide that information as much, you need to reverse engineer. How does the software control that information? It's also clunky in today's systems. Basically today, operating system can influence where an address maps to in DRAM through the virtual physical address translation, right? Or operating system basically uh, is able to uh, allocate a different physical frame to a given virtual uh, page uh, of a process. And if you look at the physical address, it can be expressed this way. You have physical frame number coming from the top bits. And uh, those top bits uh, also correspond to banks and rows in this particular address mapping, assuming the hardware has this mapping, which means that the operating system can select carefully which physical frame number alloc it allocates to a process, a given virtual page, uh, to ensure that it maps to a given bank. Right? Of course, it needs to know this address mapping to be able to do this intelligently. And this actually enables a lot of things. Uh, operating system can influence which bank, channel, rank a virtual page is mapped to. And this is called page coloring. It's a form of page coloring, basically. It can color the pages such that uh, some uh, accesses that are happening with some other accesses go to different banks, for example, or different channels. Right? And there are many examples of this. You can minimize bank conflicts. You can minimize inter-application interference. You can minimize latency in the network. Uh, and these are our works. If, if I was talking about quality of service, for example, I would be talking about these works that reduce memory interference by doing this page coloring across the channels. Of course, you need to do it intelligently because otherwise you risk underutilizing your memory bandwidth. That's always the downside. If you try to uh, separate things from each other to isolate, to reduce memory interference, you always risk underutilizing your memory bandwidth because you may actually overload some channel or overload some bank or not maximally utilized by uh, some particular structure. But this is one of the early works that we've done. Uh, and I think memory channel partitioning is employed uh, in many processors. At least, you know, uh, I think there, there could be more to be done. But bank partitioning is actually similar. Uh, you do it at the bank level. And we'll see something called subarrays. I think there's going to be a lot more partitioning that happens in the systems. And this is another work that basically does application to core mapping uh, to, to reduce interference also. Okay, more on reducing bank conflicts very quickly. This is something that I covered in five years ago. Uh, this was published in 2012. This was one of our early works in DRAM. Basically, if you look at the DRAM, so far I fooled you a little bit. <laughs> I said uh, it consists of these banks. That is true. And this is the logical abstraction of a bank. But internally, if you go into a bank, it consists of even smaller structures called subarrays. And this is done so that, because if, if you have 32,000 rows over here, the interconnect is so long that the latency is too much. And internally, DRAM manufacturers chop this up into smaller subarrays, and each subarray has its own sense amplifiers, and then there's a global uh, I.O. circuitry outside. So these subarrays are much smaller, so the interconnect that you use in the bit lines to sense uh, the data of a row is much shorter. As a result, you get much lower latency. Now, which means that this opens up an opportunity uh, some address can map to this subarray and some other address can map to this subarray. So they're, even though they map to the same bank, they conflict in the same bank, they're actually not conflicting in the internal subarrays. So if you're a little bit smart, you could change the structure of the DRAM a little bit such that these subarrays operate mostly independently. If you do that, you get rid of a lot of bank conflicts actually because it turns out a bank has about 128 or so subarrays. Which means that you actually, you can pair, if, you, if, you, if, if the addresses go to different subways, you can essentially pipeline them. And that's the idea of this paper. And if you're interested, you can take a look at it. Uh, 
this was uh, this is still being pushed through the DRAM stand. This is one interesting thing in DRAM. You have to go through this genetic committee that decides the standard. And there are some companies that are heavily pushing this stand. So the four page paper that I described from Intel and Samsung actually evaluates this idea two years later uh, than we published. And it says that, oh, we can actually use this idea to tolerate a lot of the memory latency that is in DRAM. So you may actually see this idea in future DRAM, but it takes time to go through the politics of the JEDEC committees, which is really interesting. Okay, that's the paper. Okay, let's talk about DRAM refresh. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more uh, later today, uh, and I'm already running late, as you can see. But this is fun, isn't it? I see everybody's attentive still, that's good. Nobody's sleeping, even though they, they may have been at the bar until 4 a.m. <laughs> okay, uh, so refresh, we've discussed the amp capacitor charge leaks over time, and the memory controller needs to refresh each row periodically. A refresh means activate plus pre-charge every row, every n milliseconds. Today, typical n is every 64 milliseconds. And at high temperatures, it's actually 32 milliseconds. Uh, so there are many implications on performance. DRAM bank is unavailable while being refreshed. So the actual refresh causes bank conflicts because while you're refreshing, you may, you're not able to access the bank. In the old times, uh, you, may, you wouldn't be able to access the entire bank actually. It was so bad. Now actually there is something called per bank refresh, uh, which at least parallelizes. You can actually access a bank while the other bank is being refreshed. So it could cause long, uh, long pause times. If you refresh all rows in a burst every 64 milliseconds, the DRAM will be unavailable, or at least the bank will be unavailable until refresh ends. So uh, in the old times, people were actually doing burst refresh. All rows were refreshed immediately after one another. Uh, but people moved to more distributed approaches to refresh, which is each row is refreshed at a different time, but at regular intervals. And this is the picture that I borrowed from Micron's technical note. This is distributed refresh, and this is burst refresh. Basically, burst refresh, you, in the refresh cycle, you refresh all the rows at the same time, and then you cannot access memory basically during this time, and then you have accesses, and then after 64 milliseconds, you refresh all the rows again, whereas here you distribute it. So distributed approaches are clearly better for, uh, for uh, quality of service. So how else can you reduce the effect of refresh on performance? Can you reduce the number of refreshes? If you actually get rid of refresh, this is very powerful, I think. Uh, and uh, let's talk about the downsides of it. Basically, each refresh consumes energy. It leads to performance degradation. DRAM rank or bank is unavailable while refreshed. It's usually bank today. Going forward, all of the DRAM will be per bank refresh. So if you, if you actually are working on per, per bank refresh, you should go to a per bank refresh. Uh, and quality of service, predictable team back that, that we just discussed. And refresh rate act limits actually DRAM density scaling as we discussed yesterday. Because as you reduce the size of the DRAM, uh, DRAM circuit, refresh becomes a bigger problem. And I'm going to talk about this later on uh, again. But as I mentioned, this is the paper that you should take a look at if you're, uh, if you're interested in refresh. And I'm going to talk about this paper also, because this is, you need to understand how real devices behave to really uh, develop mechanisms that can take advantage of the characteristics of these real devices. Okay, one thing that we will talk about uh, is basically I said that every, uh, today all of DRAM is refreshed every 64 milliseconds, right? But if you really understand the devices, you can do much better. If you look at the DRAM devices, the retention time, data retention time profile looks like this. Most of the DRAM cells can retain data for much longer than 64 milliseconds. In fact, some of them can retain data for hundreds of seconds. People actually use this to develop attacks on DRAM. You could actually take out someone's DRAM, freeze it, maybe actually keep it cold for a while. Most of the cells can retain data for hundreds of seconds, so you can actually read what someone had in their DRAM, even though the DRAM is not powered on for a long time. But even, even at normal temperature, uh, it looks like this, or high temperatures, it looks like this. So most of the cells today, we're refreshing at every 64 milliseconds, even though we don't need to. So you can, if you know this information, based on the studies that we've done, we actually verified this information. Then you can actually develop mechanisms that can take advantage of this. Perhaps, I don't know, there could be many other many ideas, right? For example, you can refresh these rows frequently, these rows not so frequently. You can get rid of 75% of the refreshes because most of the rows you refresh at a 4x lower frequency, right? Okay, so you can actually play tricks if you know the underlying hardware. And I think you can, uh, but we'll see some issues over here uh, in the later part of this talk. It turns out this is actually dependent on the location. Clearly, different rows have different retention times. But this also depends on the value pattern, what kind of data you store because of the coupling effects in the capacitors. And this also depends on time. We discuss this variable retention time phenomenon, right? So how do you enable this idea 
even though you have all these complexities? That's, that's the key question. That's a question that we've been working on for about seven years or so now. Okay. Uh, there are also other things that you can do. For example, you can parallelize refreshes with accesses. Uh, if, you can if you can slightly modify the DRM architecture uh, uh, by taking advantage of the subarrays. I'm not going to go through this. This paper has a lot of other ideas also. But if you're interested in performance impact of refreshes and how do you get rid of it, this is a paper that I would recommend. OK, let's jump to the memory controller. Actually, we, we have been talking about memory controllers because it's the memory controller's job is to, to issue refresh. And if you want to be more fancy, your memory controller needs to be more fancy and intelligent also. Maybe I should have inserted the memory controllers need to be more intelligent over here. Again, we're going to see that again. Uh, but I think if, you're, uh, if you want to scale memory into the future, if you're a software person, for example, eliminating uh, refresh at the software level is also very, very promising. So you might want to think about things like that. Okay, let's talk about memory controllers. Uh, I'm going to talk about DRM controllers specifically, but any kind of memory that has some long latency has similar characteristics that has to be controlled. Uh, and I'll use DRM as an example, but other types of memories like flash memories actually have even more sophisticated memory controllers. Other emerging memory technologies, phase change memories, spin torque transfer memory, RM, memristors, whatever uh, you're interested in, uh, they, they actually need memory controllers that are similar to DRAM and actually more sophisticated because they place other demands on the controller. For example, in DRAM, there's usually not an endurance problem. Whenever you write to a cell, you, can't, you can keep writing to it and it doesn't wear out. That's not maybe true going forward, but it's actually, it actually doesn't wear out as far as we, uh, we have tested it. But in flash memory or uh, these other types of memories, phase change memory, for example, you keep writing to a cell and after some point you're not able to write to it because you wear out the cell. And there are different mechanisms for wear out. But then you need to control this, right? How do you ensure that your memory works reasonably in the presence of this type of endurance problem? And there are many other reliability issues as well. Okay, this is an example of flash memory controller. This is uh, our earlier picture from an earlier paper. Basically, uh, they're similar to DRAM controllers except they're flash memory specific and they do much, much more. Error correction, wear out, uh, page remapping for wear out and other reasons. Uh, garbage collection, we're not going to go into. This is also very fascinating. And I think some of the uh, other technologies may look like this going into the future. DRAM may start resembling some of these controls a little bit more going forward because of the scaling issues. But if you're really interested, you can take a look at the papers that I mentioned. This is actually, some, uh, this is actually one of the major readings that I mentioned. This is our nicer picture, as you can see, uh, after eight years of research. So one of the things that happens after long, long periods of research is you can express things better as well. Okay, and you can, this is the paper that I mentioned earlier. There's also more, if you're interested in SSDs, uh, this is another work that we've done uh, where you can, this actually is actually a simulator that we've released for SSDs that you can download and use and simulate anything you want. This is, as far as I know, the most accurate and fastest simulator, given that it was released very recently. And uh, we've been doing other work also uh, on quality of service. Okay, let's talk about DRAM types a little bit because memory, DRAM is interesting because there are a lot of types of DRAM. Uh, and uh, it has different interfaces optimized for different purposes. Commodity DRAM is DDR, double data rate protocol. You don't need to really understand what it is. It's a circuit level protocol underneath. Low power DRAM, it's optimized for low power. It's lower voltage also. High bandwidth DRAM, graphics uh, DRAM, for example, it's optimized for higher bandwidth. So it has higher latencies also. Uh, low latency DRAM, uh, embedded DRAM, or reduced latency DRAM, these are usually very expensive. Uh, and 3D stack DRAM, a little bit more expensive, but not as much as low latency, wide IO, HPM, HMC, dot, dot, dot. So underlying microarchitecture is fundamentally the same. So everything we've discussed so far applies to all of these, really. <laughs> the DRAM internally is exactly the same in all of these. So it's very fundamental. But the interface is different, and how you 3D stack it, for example, is different. We're going to talk about that. So a flexible memory controller can support various DRAM types, and it should support various DRAM types to be able to be flexible, right? So that you can plug and play different DRAM. But it's usually not like that. This, but it usually supports some number of DRAM types, and this complicates the memory controller. So off the bat, by supporting multiple different DRAM types, you're complicated. So this, this part of the talk will be all about complexity of the memory controller. So it's difficult to support all types and upgrades also. Uh, so Intel, for example, at some point was supporting this fully buffered dim, uh, DIMMs and they've dropped it ever sin since because it didn't take off. Uh, so that's an example. They built memory controllers and memory controllers were not use useful. Mm -hmm. So you can see that fully buffered DIMMs don't exist anymore. Uh, okay, if you're interested in what a fully buffered DIMM is, you can search or talk to me. 
Okay, these are some different DRAM types. This is based on a paper that, uh, where we released our DRAM simulator. If you're working on, uh, working on DRAM, I recommend using it. We support the simulator. If you have questions, you can ask. But it supports a bunch of standards. We're going to talk about that later on. But clearly, there, even at 2015, there are a lot of different DRAM types. And these are for different reasons, uh, as we've discussed. But let's talk about the DRAM controller. What does the DRAM controller need to do uh, to DRAM? First of all, it needs to ensure correct operation. It needs to ensure refresh is obeyed. It needs to ensure all of the timing constraints are obeyed. For example, you cannot issue, uh, you cannot issue a read command before the row is activated. So there's a timing constraint between read and activate. And you need to know that constraint as a controller and you need to ensure that that's obeyed. And there are many, many other timing constraints like this that are required for the purpose of correct operation. And this is already complicated to begin with. You need to service DRAM requests while obeying the timing constraints, as I said. Uh, but there are other constraints, not timing, but resource conflicts. You need to keep track of the banks, buses, channels, if you're controlling multiple channels. Minimum right to read delays, that's a timing constraints. And you need to translate requests to DRAM command sequences, because request is at a higher level. I want to read this address this much, and then you need to translate them into DRAM command sequences, right? Uh, and you need to buffer and schedule requests for high performance, quality of service. We're going to talk about, we, we talked about that earlier, right? A row hit, re row hit request is much faster than a row conflict request. And you want to reorder uh, the, row, uh, the requests that go to the same row that's already open so that you can maximize the bandwidth, minimize the latency, assuming that's your goal. That may not always be the best goal. Uh, but if, if you do that, you need to actually do the reordering, which means that you need to do the buffering of the request, scheduling of the requests, and all of the management of the row buffer, bank, rank, bus. So this is already complicated. And on top of that, power consumption is important. You need to manage power consumption and terminals in DRAM today. You need to turn on and off DRAM chips, manage power modes, which I'm not going to go into a lot, uh, except for one slide later on. So as a result, a modern DRAM controller is relatively complicated. Uh, you have this arbiter, for example, and also you, need to, you have different types of requests. It's not CPU only, it's IO, but it's also different accelerators. How do you actually arbitrate between them? And how do you actually uh, ensure that uh, you, you maintain correct operation and high, high performance operation? I'm going to skip this, but you can take a look at it. So let's talk about scheduling policies very quickly. Uh, this is not a scheduling policy, first come, first serve. I guess it is a scheduling policy, but it's the, you don't need to do anything. You just take the first thing in the queue and uh, ensure that everything else is uh, fine. Uh, many modern DRAM controllers use this uh, because row hits are much less costly much lower latency, they prioritize the row hit requests in the bu row buffer. And all else being equal, they prioritize all the requests. Clearly, this is good for maximizing the row buffer hit rate. If you open the row buffer, you're going to make use of it as much as possible with this policy. This maximizes DRAM throughput. Uh, and we were, you, can, you can read this on your own. The scheduling is really done at the command level. So even though I talk about requests over here, you need to really think about commands when you design a memory scheduler. Okay, this was looking much better. I, I thought I fixed the problem. There, there is a calibration thing that, I, that you need to do. And it definitely looks much better. So I'll give you a break. Is, are there any uh, burning questions now? This place. Okay, arrangement, color. It is calibrated. Okay. Maybe we need to understand how... Look at that. That cannot be... Uh, okay. Now you go back to full screen, it's not calibrated. But I do want to go back to full screen because it's the recording is that way, okay. Anyway, I guess I wasted one minute. <laughs> okay, when you see the slides, this is fine. We've already gone through this basic DM bank operation. Uh, this is to jog your memory. Robot for hits are much faster than robot for conflicts because on a conflict, you need to, uh, uh, you need to basically first pre-charge the bank, pre-charge the array, and then uh, activate and then read. Okay. So scheduling policy is essentially a prioritization order. And this could be based on many, many things. Request age, robot for hit miss status, request type, prefetch, read or write, requester type, load miss or store miss, which core is the request coming from, request criticality, is it the oldest miss in the core, is it enabling many other misses, how many instructions are in the core are dependent on it, will it stall the processor, and interference cost to other cores. How much is this request going to affect some other core's request or some other accelerator's request or some I.O. request? Actually, I.O. is a big problem because I.O. goes through the memory and you usually transfer a lot of data, bulk data, for I.O. purposes, and that interferes with your CPU when it's trying to access memory. So how do you actually manage all of this in the memory controller? And 
So basically, how do you design a good DM memory scheduling policy is uh, not easy. And I'm going to talk about an idea that we developed a long time ago, which I think is promising. Uh, some of you may or may not like it, but hopefully uh, there, there's a lot more to do in that area. There's also row buffer management policies. Uh, do you keep the row open after you access it? Open row means you keep the row open after an access in anticipation that some other request will come and access that row. If that's true, that's good. If that's not true, that's bad because now you kept the row open, you wasted power, you also uh, delayed the other requests that came. Right? And closed row is exactly opposite. You close the row after an access, but you don't do it stupidly. You first check the queue. If there are no other requests already in the request queue, then you close it. Because it makes no sense if there are other requests in the request queue to close it, unless there's an, another reason to close it. Uh, so this is good if the next access is, goes to a different row. You avoid a row conflict and save some energy, because whenever you keep the row open, you're wasting energy also. Because you're running through the sense amplifiers, and sense amplifiers are just operating at that time. And next access might need the same row. This, in this case, it's not good. Right? So many systems today employ adaptive policies. They try to predict a little bit whether or not uh, the next access to the bank will be to the same row, and they act accordingly. Actually, there's a really good paper from Intel uh, at, at the Design Automation Conference this year that talks about uh, robot for management policies and scheduling. If you're interested, you can take a look at it. This is the Intel Microarchitecture Research Labs. Okay, I'm going to skip this. You can actually read uh, this. This basically summarizes what I just said in the previous slide with an example over here. Okay, power management is important. The EM chips have power modes. Uh, so the key idea in these power modes is when accessing, when you're not accessing a chip, power it down somehow. You can do it at different levels. Basically, active is the highest power state. All banks idle is another next level. Power down is another state. And the lowest power is self-refresh. Basically, everything is turned off except the DRAM automatically refreshes itself, which is what's happening here right now when I'm not touching it. <laughs> it's self-refreshing all of its memory. So that's why it's consuming refresh power. Uh, of course, there's a trade-off here. Whenever you want to transition between different states, you incur some latency. So a, this is a latency energy trade-off. If you want to save power, you need to be able to tolerate that latency. So that's why you don't go into the self-refresh mode every so often, because getting out of the self-refresh mode takes a long time to power up all of that circuitry that you need to access the UAM. OK, no burning questions? Everybody still following me? Yes, one burning question. How good is, how good is the predictor? Uh, the row buffer management predictor? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually, it could be really good, but it could, like all other predictors, it can do wrong. Take a look at the paper in, uh, in DAC, Design Automation Conference from uh, Intel. They actually have a very good uh, set of workloads that they have examined this. I think they examined it over hundreds of workloads. These different uh, power modes, how much? Yeah, yeah, there's a huge difference in power saving. So active, uh, uh, if you're active, you're basically consuming more than a thousand times compared to self-refresh. So whenever you're active, it's a lot. <laughs> yes. Column commands are prioritized over row commands. That's right. I thought that was the other way around, it's not. Well, the column command is accessing uh, an already open row. That's what it means, basically. You're prioritizing accesses that go to the open row. Yeah. OK, one more. What's the latency as a number of bank? You need to transition from one power state to another. Oh, what are the latencies? So if you go out of self-refresh state, it could be microseconds, for example. Hundreds of microseconds, potentially. So it's very long latencies. Of course, different state transitions. Have, you, can, you can read some papers in this area. If you're interested, I can point you to some papers. OK. Uh, so why are these controls? I'll talk about difficulty of DRAM control a little bit, uh, because I think there's a lot more work to be done in this area. Uh, basically, you need to obey DRAM timing constraints for correctness, and there are many timing constraints in DRAM, more than 50, actually more than 100. Uh, and you can read the DRAM data sheets that I referenced earlier to look at them. One of them is write to read latency. This is the minimum number of cycles you need to wait before issuing a read command after a write command is issued. Actually, this is at the... Uh, you, you, cannot, uh, you cannot be writing, from one, writing to one bank while you're reading from another bank. That's one un unfortunate thing in DRAM because you need to change the direction of the bus. And that causes a lot of issues. So the controllers need to be very intelligent about how they schedule reads versus writes. And RC is actually, this is the main parameter that most people use to understand the latency of DRAM. This is the minimum number of cycles between issuing two consecutive activate commands to the same bank. Basically, the bank conflict latency. How long does it take? Today, it's about 15 nanoseconds in commodity DRAM, which is a lot. 
You need to keep track of many resources. I already said this to prevent conflicts. Otherwise, you may be operating correctly, incorrectly, or you may be losing performance. Right? If you're actually not uh, utilizing these well, you may be losing a lot of performance. You need to handle DRM refresh. You need to manage power consumption. And you need to optimize performance and quality of service, especially in the presence of these constraints. Reordering is not simple. And fairness and quality of service issues complicate the problem. For example, if you have a GPU that requires a particular frame rate and the CPU is latency sensitive, you need to handle all of those. And you may have other hardware accelerators also that require different kinds of service. And they all go through the same memory controller. That's what happens in this SOC today. In almost all SOCs, that's true for the laptop also. So the memory controller is really the center of the universe for these. And if you mess up the policies, then you may mess up everything else. That's why these are important. Uh, okay, so these are example DRM timing constraints. If you want to know what these are, uh, pre-charge latency. We're going to talk about this later on when we talk about latency, hopefully. But there are a lot. Uh, and this is one paper that talks about how to actually minimize the right to read delays in DRM. This is another example. Uh, if you're actually really interested in DRM operation, these two papers that we've written early on describe uh, very lucidly uh, why you need these constraints. For example, this is the constraint between activate and pre-charge because you need to ensure that uh, uh, things stabilize in DRAM. Uh, and that, and again, I'm not going to go through this in detail. These papers have all the interesting details. But just to show you, there are constraints between activate and read. You need to ensure that the data is stable uh, uh, in the raw buffer, in the, in the readable state. Activate and write, those are very similar. It's called TRCD. That's a major parameter in DRAM. But let me pick this one also. This is TRC. That's basically activate to activate. That's the bank conflict latency. And there are reasons for all of these delays. And some of these are really specified. Uh, these are not specified in DRM data sheets. That's a bit unfortunate. DRM data sheets are very mechanical. They don't tell you the reasons for things. But these papers will tell you the reasons for why these things exist. OK, th this is really ugly, isn't it? I'm going to switch to this so that you don't suffer. Doesn't this look better? Yes. Yeah, I think. Anyway, maybe I should switch to something other than PowerPoint. OK, uh, Okay, you can read these papers, basically. Uh, DRAM controller design is actually becoming more difficult because of the reason that I said a little bit earlier. Uh, you have heterogeneous agents, CPUs, GPUs, hardware accelerators, and who knows what coming. Uh, and main memory interference happens between all of them. And they share things at different levels. And there are many timing constraints for various memory types. So it's not just DRAM. It's maybe hybrid memory also. Uh, and there are many goals that you need to optimize for at the same time, performance, fairness, quality of service, energy efficiency. So how do you design intelligent memory controller is really critical. And I think this is another motivation for main memory controllers to become intelligent, because you really need a lot of intelligence just to be able to handle the scheduling of the requests. We're not even talking about doing processing, right? But scheduling of the requests is processing itself. You're really processing the requests. So you need logic to do processing over there. Uh, let me talk about one thing that we envisioned when we first, well, at one of the first, time, first years that where we were looking at the problem. Uh, so it's clearly difficult to optimize all these different constraints while maximizing performance, quality of service, and energy efficiency. Wouldn't it be nice if you actually had a DRAM controller that automatically found a good scheduling policy on its own? But this was before the machine learning hype. So I'm happy that we did before the machine learning hype. Uh, but I think this is a very good place where machine learning could benefit uh, the design of a system, if you're intelligent. But you need to be very careful and intelligent about it. You cannot just throw a neural network and expect that it works magically. You really need to design the controller carefully. So this was the idea that we, uh, this was one of the things that I did while uh, I was at Microsoft Research with my intern at the time, who is now a professor at uh, University of Rochester, Angina Peck. Uh, and we said DRAM controllers are difficult to design. It's difficult for human designers to come up with a policy that can adapt itself very well to different workloads under different system conditions, because workloads are changing also. DRAM is difficult, but workloads are also changing, and you need to cater for that. Changing dynamically, not just changing over years. It's really changing over the course of nanoseconds. Uh, so the, our idea was to design a memory control that adapts its scheduling policy decisions to workload behavior and system conditions using machine learning. And our key observation is this, actually. If you look at a memory controller, you could think of it as a reinforcement learning agent. So reinforcement learning, which is a machine learning technique that's been used for several things, like ha uh, figure, uh, having helicopters that figure out how to fly themselves. You first fail a little bit, but then you, st you figure out how to fly. Uh, you do that in the memory controller, maybe more safely. Uh, basically, uh, it, it maps nicely. 
So a memory controller is a reinforcement learning agent that dynamically and continuously learns and employs the best scheduling policy. That's the key idea over here. So what's a reinforcement learning? Essentially, we are reinforcement learning agents as human beings. You, this is actually Pavlov's theory. Do you guys know about Ivan Pavlov, who basically experimented with dogs and figured out that uh, they can associate food with bells, and whenever you ring the bell, they're there to get the food, right? Essentially, this is very similar. Uh, you, uh, you're an agent, you take an action, you observe a reward based on your action, and you observe the state uh, later on, and based on the state and based on the expected reward that you would like to get, you take another action. And then you, keep, you take actions such that you maximize the long-term reward that you get. Paolo's dogs maximized the food that they got. Of course, that was a very simple reinforcement learning. There was not much complexity involved over there. Uh, you know, so you can think of the scheduler in a very similar way. Basically, in this case, the reward that you get is a data bus utilization. This is very important. This depends, the, the reward that you specify is, depends on your goal. If you want to maximize data bus utilization, which may be worthwhile in some cases, you reward uh, uh, the scheduler if, it increases the, if, if its action increases the data bus utilization. So the action is the scheduled command. The scheduler schedules the command, observes the reward. Is the data bus utilized or not? And uh, later it observes the state. Uh, and based on the state and based on the expected reward that it would get if it takes a particular action, it takes an action and it updates the state action pairs based on the reward it receives, based on the action it's taken in a given particular state. So it's all about associating a state, uh, a state action pair with an expected long-term reward. At a given state, you have possible actions. You pick the one that maximizes the long-term reward. So I say long-term because short-term reward may not be what you want to optimize. Because at the short-term, you may utilize the data bus. But at the long-term, that may cause a lot of underutilization of the data bus. So you really need to change these rewards or uh, learn these rewards in a way that uh, is long-term. And how you do that, that's in the paper. I'm not going to go through that. And reinforcement learning theory talks a lot about that. Yes? Yeah, so here I have a question. Yeah. So the action that uh, you are using here is based on the, some prediction based on the, uh, the taken uh, action to the result in reward or not. So yeah. I think I'm looking at the future. How about uh, a system that looks at error? Like, so for the issued uh, uh, policy, what the error is, I'm basically fixing it, trying to minimize the error. So I, it depends on how you define the error in this case. Because you don't know what a correct action is. So this is unsupervised learning, right? If you supervise learning, you know uh, whether your action was correct or not. In this case, you don't know what's correct or not because this is really optimizing some performance metric. So for example, su uh, supervised learning, uh, the example is branch prediction. Let's say you need to predict whether the branch is taken or not. After you resolve the branch, you know whether your action was correct or not. In this case, there's no such thing. You're, you're always doing an action that's legal, that's correct, but you don't know its impact on performance immediately. So this is, uh, that's the difference. So you don't know the error in this case. Yes? Does, does that reward me to guarantee quality of service? No, not in this case, yeah. So you, th that's future work, basically. There, there's some work. I'm going to talk, this reward metric is good for maximizing data bus utilization. So if an, if an application is utilizing data bus really well, whereas another one is not utilizing data bus really well, you'll be prioritizing that application that's utilizing the data bus really well. So it's not, this is not designed to uh, provide quality of service. But th that's why it's interesting. There's a lot more re future work to be done in this area. OK, so you maximize the reward, and there's some reward function that you can read in the paper. But basically, you can dynamically adapt the memory scheduling policy via interaction with the system at runtime with this one. You associate system states and actions with long-term reward values. Each action at a given state learn, uh, leads to a learned reward. And you schedule the command with the highest estimated long-term reward value in each state. You continuously update the reward values for different state action pairs based on feedback or data bus utilization feedback from the system. How you do that, you should really look at the paper. But basically, you need to uh, observe the transaction queue, look at the state, take an action, get the reward. So what are these? The key things in designing a learning algorithm, especially unsupervised learning algorithm like this, is you need to specify the reward function, state attributes, and actions. Reward function, is, in this case, is very simple. It doesn't take into account a lot of other issues, like power management, quality of service. The key issue is how do you specify a reward function that takes into account many, many other things. But that needs to be done going forward if you would like to pursue this idea, for example. In this case, it's very simple for data bus utilization. You can see that. 
State attributes, how do you figure out, this is actually the complexity is here really, how do you figure out your state attributes and your reward function because what do you look at in your state? And these are things that we've done. So you need to do some feature selection process. We actually looked at maybe 500 or so different state attributes that are possible to take from uh, the multi-core system and we pruned them down to this number of state attributes, maybe eight or so if you count them over here. These, are, these were the eight most powerful ones if you act after a lot of simulations uh, through feature selection. So these, are, these state attributes are uh, looked at, uh, are, are defined statically in our case. You might want to look at dynamic state attributes, but that's, that was, that's not what we did. And the actions are basically these uh, actions. You can activate, write, these are, these are the legal commands. Okay, so what's the benefit of this? I'll give you, uh, an, so that, for example, there's an interesting uh, thing over here, pre-charge preemptive action. Uh, that means that you, you open it, after you open the row, you preemptively pre-charge it. Meaning that you can issue a pre-charge even though nobody else in the queue, no, no request in the queue requires a pre-charge. So this is actually anticipating potentially that somebody else is going to access this, uh, this, uh, this bank later on, so I want uh, to a uh, ha have a bank conflict later on, so I should pre-charge the bank preemptively su such that I reduce the latency of access of that bank conflict later on. And no opposite action also. So one more thing over here. Uh, if, if you're designing a robust machine learning system, you should never follow the policy all the time. There's always a trade-off between exploration and exploitation in machine learning. So sometimes you actually take random actions, random legal actions to explore the state space. Otherwise, you may actually go into uh, a, a place in the state space where you actually are at the local minimum and you can never get out of it. So once in a while, I think about 5% of the time, our controller selects a command that's random. And you, of course, you can vary the, uh, vary the parameter that determines how much you explore and how much you exploit. I think this is very similar to humans also, basically. Humans should not always follow a given policy. Sometimes you randomly explore. That way you can actually find out new things that you never uh, may have even thought of, right? So maybe we can learn from machines in this case, <laughs> if you're not doing that. <laughs> okay, so what are the performance implications? I'm not going to go through this in detail, but it improves performance significantly. It's about 20% compared to uh, the baseline scheduler. And these are parallel applications. So these are applications that would actually benefit from improving data bus utilization because they're really limited by how much data you can transfer from memory uh, in a given uh, time. Uh, there is no quality of service problem, at least at a, at a, as a first order problem in these applications because we're not running different applications. So if you're designing a scheduler for that purpose, this may be a good policy to switch to. And also there may not be a single policy in your scheduler. Sometimes you switch to a policy that's good for the applications, right? This is application specific policies. There's a lot to explore there. Again, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have time to do that. And 70% is the benefit you get with a very optimistic scheduler that ignores a lot of the constraints except for the data bus constraint. Okay, let's talk about the advantage and disadvantage very quickly. So it turns out this adapts the scheduling policy dynamically to changing workload behavior and maximize a long-term target. It reduces the designer's burden in finding a good scheduling policy. Designer specifies what system variables might be useful and what target to optimize, but not how to optimize it. it he or she needs to specify the reward function, that's critical, and the state space uh, that the scheduler sees. But now if you look at the state space that we've discussed, there are many, many uh, states, uh, different bits and pieces of the state that you can actually input to the scheduler. It's not just, oh, is it a robot for hit? And what's the age of the request? So it's much more complicated right now. It's complicated because the machine learning takes care of uh, the learning part. Of course, disadvantages, it's a black box. This is usually designer uh, is much less likely to implement what she cannot easily reason about. That's true. Uh, that's a true issue when you uh, deal with humans who are designers. But if a machine was designing it, maybe that would be a different thing. Uh, and how do you specify different reward functions that can achieve different objectives? Fairness, quality of service, power, dot, 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 and, the compli and combinations of those. So there's a lot to do in this area, and there's also hardware complexity. So if you look at the design that we have, it's relatively complex, but it's not that bad. You just need a 32 kilobyte table uh, in the memory controller. Okay, so that's the paper. This was published in ISCA 2008. Uh, I think there's a lot more to do in this area. Uh, there's some work from Google that is in this direction, I think. I think Parth actually in his keynote talked about it. Uh, they actually, uh, in ICML, they're publishing a paper that uh, learns the memory access patterns to do better prefetching. So that's another example uh, of uh, uh, using machine learning to improve the system design in, in, in the memory system. Okay, let's talk about simulating memory and then we're going to switch to the next topic which we're very late on. 
So I'll talk about your emulator very quickly. This is a simulator that we've designed. If you're interested in doing memory research, I would recommend using the emulator. Uh, basically, the reason we designed it is was this is actually is, this is actually the uh, one of the latest incarnations of the simulators that we've been developing on DRAM for the course of last probably 12 years now since 2006 when I joined Microsoft Research. Uh, so there are many new up and upcoming standards, many new controller designs, and a fast and easy to extend simulator is very much needed. We recognize the need. As you can see, there are many standards and there are many more. This is 2015. Uh, so Ramulator provides out-of-the-box support for many DRAM standards, and we keep adding more standards like HMC Hybrid Memory Cube. Uh, and it's very fast, uh, and it's modular and extensible, so it's relatively easy to modify. You can see some performance numbers over here. Uh, and you can do studies like this, for example. You can compare the different DRAM standards and how they impact performance or power, in this case it's performance, of different workloads that you may be interested in. So this is DDR4, for example. You can say, oh, DDR4 improves performance by about, I don't know, 14% uh, over here compared to DDR3 on these workloads that we've tested. And you can see that high bandwidth memory improves performance a lot more. You can see that some of them actually reduce performance. LPDDR, low power DDR, reduces performance compared to DDR3 because its latencies are higher. So you can actually understand the system. You can actually evaluate new ideas also. So very level parallelism is here, for example, it improves performance significantly compared to DDR4 uh, in this case. Okay, so if you're interested, you can take a look at it. Uh, and it's an optional assignment for you. I know you don't have time for assignments, but maybe, maybe while you're at the bar, you can do this together, <laughs> collectively. Okay, uh, yeah, if you're interested, uh, let me know. Uh, we support the emulator. There's a lot more to do here. Uh, you can compare some of the standards. And all of the benchmarks uh, that we've tested are also available. Okay, these are topics that we will not cover. They're important. I've discussed this last time. And there are some more suggested readings for the first... Uh, uh, first topic. I divided this into topic and you can find these in your slides and I actually put up some readings uh, with, the, with the not so good internet over here uh, on, the, on the course website so you can take a look at that. There are more slides over here you can look at the backup slides. For example I think I would really recommend this, these slides. I don't really have time to go through it but this is one of my students Vivek Sashadri who did his thesis on in-memory computation and virtual memory abstractions. He basically put together a nice set of slides where you can actually go through all of this and you can figure out from the bottom up how a DRAM chip really works. I didn't do this because it takes a while, but I think you have time later on how do you actually build a DRAM chip from the very bottom up. As you can see, it's being simulated right now. <laughs> okay, and that's the end. Uh, you can actually go through the operation of the DRAM chip as well as you can see over here. And uh, there's more, but now my computer is going faster than I can stop it. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, so this is a good place to switch to the next lecture topic. Uh, where is our next lecture topic? Okay, topic two. Any burning questions? Any other burning questions? Today you guys are more interactive, that's good. You can overlap the latency of my computer with your <laughs> questions, but maybe it's too late. <laughs> okay, I'll do one thing actually. I'll be a bit smarter about this. Uh, stop recording. Oh, you don't see what's this. Okay. 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 So now we're on to the second topic, a little bit later than I expected. We're going to talk about uh, reliability and security and do a deep dive into this. And I think this is really important. There's going to be a lot more interesting reliability and security issues that in memory that's going to affect the entire systems. Okay, uh, yeah, this is one of the three key challenges that we're going to talk about. And that's an example. Does anybody know who this is? <coughs> I've given you the name actually. It's Maslow's triangle. That's right, yes. He's known for the triangle. This is Abraham Maslow. He is a very famous American psychologist uh, who dedicated his life basically to understand this question basically. Why do human things do, do, do the things they do, essentially? Uh, and uh, he came up with this hierarchy of needs, and he's well known for this thing over here. Basically, he says that you have to have your physiological needs and safety needs satisfied before you can talk about or think about love. And then before, uh, you need to have that satisfied before you can, you can think about esteem, and you need to have that satisfied before you can think about highest level forms of art and self-actualization. 
you can summarize this as who cares about uh, modern art if you're being threatened at the moment, right? And about to die. So that's why we need to start with reliability and security. But if you're really interested in psychology, you should take a look at uh, his work. And his work is influenced by a lot of existential ph philosophers in the past. Uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, and at that time, uh, like while he was developing his theories, uh, uh, there were two major other movements, like behavioral psychology by B.F. Skinner. That was one of the major things. And psychoanalysis, of course, from Sigmund Freud. That was the first one that was developed. And this, he created a, one of the third movements in psychology, if you will, together with other existential psychologists. But anyway, he, he clearly figured out what was the basic thing. And this is true for computers also. I give a lot of these analogies between computers and humans. But this is another example. Does anybody know what this bridge is? Yes? Tacoma Bridge. Tacoma Bridge. Tacoma Are you from Seattle? No? OK. How do you know this? Sorry. It collapsed, okay, so people know that it collapsed, that's good. <laughs> so I get the answer, Golden Gate Bridge. Golden Gate Bridge was actually designed before this, and people who worked at the Golden Gate Bridge worked at the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, this is on the Hood River Canal, uh, a little bit south of Seattle. I crossed the new incarnation of this bridge many, many times to go to the Olympic National Park, uh, and you can do that, uh, but not this bridge. <laughs> so what happened to this bridge is, this happened, <laughs> basically, uh, this is a very famous bridge where it collapsed because of aerostatic flutter. Uh, there, were a lot, there were a lot of interesting stories about it. And if you want to read about the stories, you should really look at this uh, link over here uh, from Washington Department of Transportation. They have a history of the events as to what happened uh, in the collapse of this bridge. But this is an example of a reliability problem affecting security and safety. And actually, people were on this bridge. Uh, uh, and the professor actually who was doing uh, stuff to understand why this bridge is, go is doing those things. He believed until the very end that the bridge will not collapse. <laughs> but the bridge collapsed and he tried to rescue the dog in the, in the car uh, that was on the bridge, but he was not able to, as far as I understand. Okay, uh, why am I telling you this? Because it's an example of a reliability problem that actually affects security and safety of humans. And this is another example. These people who are constructing stuff during the wartime in Manhattan, they look very happy, right? But you can ask the question, how secure and safe are they, right? So there's a if there's a reliability problem here, we may not see these people anymore. So security, in my opinion, is about preventing unforeseen consequences. Uh, this is a very broad definition of security. And how do you design systems that can prevent unforeseen consequences? Actually, some of these, you can argue, are foreseen. But uh, maybe the consequences of the foreseen may be unforeseen, right? <laughs> Okay, uh, so that's why we need to talk about security. And DRM scaling problem is as much about, uh, is, is very much about the connection between reliability and security. In fact, this may be one of the very, very critical examples, maybe the most prominent example where we're going to tie a reliability issue in hardware with a huge security problem in the systems. I don't know of any other example that actually makes this connection uh, as strongly so far. We've discussed this already. You need this DRM circuit. Uh, uh, to work reliably, and for that to be reliable, the capacitor and the access transistor and, uh, uh, and the sensing circuitry must be reliable. And uh, we're having issues with the reliability. So this is one example. Uh, this is a study that we did with Facebook. My student, Justin, went to Facebook, and he did an internship there. And he analyzed all of the data that they have uh, in their servers worldwide. And they have a lot of servers. Now, don't ask what they're doing with, with the, uh, what they're doing with your data on their servers. But they have a lot of memory errors on their servers also. So basically, uh, they have so many servers that they don't allow us to publish the number of servers and the amount of memory that we've tested. But believe me, it's a lot. Uh, and this is a correlational study. Basically, you see that uh, as the chip density is growing, the relative failure rate of the servers, because of memory errors, is also growing. The reason is uh, chips that are larger have cells that are closer to each other, they're cramped, and they're more vulnerable to faults. Uh, and this is a trend. Other people have looked at this trend also in Google's and Microsoft servers, and they say they've seen similar results. Our data is maybe a little bit more comprehensive and newer. This was from 2015. And if you're really interested in other trends that are similar to this, you can take a look at it. Uh, but these sort of large-scale studies are very informative because they tell you the trend of what's happening in terms of reliability in this case. And then we also were very interested in exploring this at the small scale. So we built these memory controllers that are essentially FPGA-based memory controllers. Well, 
Yeah, there's a fan or FPGA here, but this is the earliest incarnation of the uh, system that we have. We have these Xilinx boards where we have a memory controller, and we plug this memory controller to test memory chips. And the reason we built it was to study the retention behavior of DRAM, because retention behavior, we knew that that was critical for memory. When we wrote the radar paper, we said, oh, you could actually get rid of a lot of refreshes, but let's see if we can really get rid of all those refreshes in real life. Uh, that's why we had to study this behavior. Uh, and while we were doing that, we actually studied many, many other things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and this is, uh, this is one of the systems where we could do many, many uh, uh, parallel memory testing. This is not the newest system, but this is where Rohammer was discovered, which I'm going to talk about. And we actually open sourced this infrastructure. If you're really interested in doing FPGA-based uh, uh, studies of uh, DRAM, you can download it. This is the paper that we published. It's flexible. Uh, we actually uh, have a C++ API, so it's actually a C++ programmable memory testing infrastructure. You don't need to deal with the individual DRAM commands, you just need to use the C++ functions that we provide to actually uh, test memory. And it's open source, you can download it, you can let me know how it goes. You, you just need an FPGA, we don't provide the FPGA. But it's not hopefully that expensive. Okay, so one of the things that we wanted to test uh, when we built this infrastructure was this data retention. I've already shown you this one. Basically, we said, oh, uh, what does what the DRAM retention time profile look like? And we figured out it looks like this. And now you can develop many, many mechanisms if you know this information reliably. But we also figured out this is dependent on the location, this depends on the stored value pattern, this depends on time. And we're going to talk about that later. Uh, but one of the things we discovered, uh, one of my students, Yungu Kim, and other students working together, they discovered that uh, you can also predictably induce memory errors in most DRAM chips. Now, this is a bit scary because of this predictably part. We knew that you could induce errors, right, by changing the refresh rate, for example, or by, by, by taking a, a flashlight or some, a heat source, putting it next to DRAM, you're going to induce a lot of errors. But we're going to induce errors program, program edit, uh, programmatically, basically, with, by programming and predictably. This should not happen, right? And because it's predictable, it causes a security problem that I'm going to talk about as well. This is the DRAM row hammer phenomenon, and it's essentially a simple hardware failure mechanism. You may see other people calling it a bug. I don't like calling it a bug. It's really a failure mechanism because it's a fundamental failure mechanism. It can create a widespread system security vulnerability. And later, people started paper, uh, writing uh, articles like this. This is a Wired article by Andy uh, that talks about forget software, now hackers are exploiting physics. And this is actually a really good title that captures the problem because we're going to exploit physics to take, uh, to take over a system. So what's the problem? Let's talk about the fundamental low-level problem. Uh, if you look at DRAM or any type of memory, it consists of uh, basically rows. We've discussed this as a bank structure, right? If you want to access a row, you need to activate the row, apply high voltage to that word line. Now, if you want to access another row, you deactivate or pre-charge that uh, array, apply low voltage. This is just a read process, right? Activate, pre-charge. And if you keep doing this over and over, fast enough, enough times, before the cells get refreshed, it turns out in most modern DRAM chips, adjacent rows get corrupt. Some bits in the adjacent rows get corrupt. They flip, basically. They flip from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0. They basically lose charge. This is essentially the problem. By reading a row repeatedly, many, many times before the cells get refreshed, you can corrupt cells in adjacent rows. Now those adjacent rows may be mapped to the operating system, may be mapped to some other application, may be mapped to some, your own application, but it shouldn't happen. By reading memory, you should not corrupt memory. Even by writing memory, you should not corrupt memory, right? You should not corrupt memory at all. Uh, so we call this the hammered row, we call this the victim rows, uh, and we showed that you can actually induce these errors in most real DRAM chips you can buy today. What does most mean? Most means more than 80% of the chips that we've tested uh, in about 2012, uh, time frame. The paper is published in 2014 because the first time it was rejected when we submitted, they said that they don't think this is going to be a big problem in future DRAM. <laughs> so <laughs> don't, don't give up. And actually, this is going to be an even bigger problem in future DRAM, as we can see. Uh, so don't give up if you get your viewer comments like that. Take the best out of the viewer comments, and some of them you can leave out. <laughs> okay, uh, so basically 80% of the DRAM chips are affected uh, for companies who's, who should remain anonymous in this case, but you can guess who they are. There are only three major manufacturers. Uh, but it's a scaling problem. It's not a company-specific problem. It's really a, a memory scaling problem. Uh, I'll talk about why this. So why, this why does this happen? Basically, cells are, uh, the, the rows are too close to each other. As a result, when you activate one row, because of uh, electrical interference, you're slightly activating the adjacent word line also. 
If you slightly activate the adjacent road line, some vulnerable cells are leaking a little bit. And if you do it enough times, you leak enough charge from the vulnerable cells before the cells get refreshed. And that's why this is happening. This is one of the reasons, actually. There are multiple reasons. It's really a combination of effects that's getting much worse as you scale the size of the circuit down. So the fundamental problem is, as you scale the size of the circuit down, uh, things are too close to each other. There's not enough electrical isolation between the cells. As a result, what you do to one cell is affecting the other cells. In this case, it's what you do to one row is affecting the other rows. And it's a scaling problem because the chips that we've tested that were manufactured before 2010 were not vulnerable to this problem. The first vulnerability we discovered was in 2010, and all of the chips that we tested that were manufactured between 2012 and 2013 actually have this problem, regardless of the manufacturer, and the error rates are very similar. This is error rate on the y-axis and when the chip was manufactured on the x-axis. And the chips are still somewhat vulnerable. We're going to talk about some of the solutions later on. So uh, that was our FPGA-based infrastructure. Uh, quickly. So what is the reason for that the chip before 2012 was because things are far away from each other. Yeah, the cells are far away from each other. There's not enough electrical interference for this. And this actually is a scaling problem. This, uh, this affects flash memory. One of the reasons we started looking into this problem because we had the FPGA-based infrastructure for flash memory, and we knew that read disturbance errors were a big problem in flash memory. So we said, oh, why not look at some of these error types in DRAM also, because DRAM was scaling very fast into smaller technology nodes. We're gonna talk about flash memory if we have time, let's see. So this was an RFPG infrastructure. You could design a memory controller that does this. But the next question is, can you actually write programs that induce these errors? And this is the program that we wrote with that paper. It's very simple, as you can see. What it does is it uh, selects addresses X and Y such that they map to different rows in the same bank. And it ensures that you avoid the cache, you avoid the row buffer, and you basically ping pong activates to X and Y like this, not this slowly but very fast, such that you do it enough times before the cells get refreshed. And if you do it enough times, now my computer is faster than me again. And if the chip is vulnerable, you can get errors. Okay, uh, so at the time we tested, you, uh, we showed that you could do it on Intel memory controllers and AMD memory controllers. This program, when this program runs, it induces a lot of errors and errors are correlated with how fast you can access memory. So if you have a good enough memory controller that can access memory fast enough, you can induce these errors. There's nothing special about Intel and AMD. Uh, other people have dem demonstrated you could do this as an ARM, IBM. It's a very industry-wide problem. You just need to have a good enough memory controller that can access memory fast enough. So it's a reliability issue. It's a more of a security issue, actually. And when we first wrote the paper, the first sentence that the paper starts with is, memory isolation is a key property of a reliable and secure computing system, and access to one memory address should not have unintended side effects on data stored in other addresses. I still believe this. This is really fundamental. You should not have these kind of errors in memory. And we said in the paper that you could actually design an attack that could take over a system. You could compromise a system completely. And the good folks at Google uh, wrote a blog post uh, that basically did that, essentially. This is the Project Zero team who was very famous for developing these attacks on hardware. They recently also discovered the uh, Meltdown and Spectre attacks. Uh, but before, they also worked on Rowhammer. And they basically said you could exploit the Rowhammer bug. Again, they, they don't call it a failure mechanism. Bug, bug sounds more fancy, I guess, and sexy, but I, I think failure mechanism is nicer. Uh, because it's a really fundamental failure mechanism that affects all types of memory. We'll talk about that later. Uh, and uh, to, they, show, they show that you can gain kernel privileges by, using a, by running a user-level program. So this is directly copy-pasted from Google's blog post which I would very much recommend that you read if you're interested in system security, hardware security. This is really a blog post to read. And they also have a Black Hat uh, presentation uh, delivered by Mark Seaborn uh, that you can watch. They basically said they learned about the problem from our paper, and they basically said they explored that uh, in, in their laptops, and they found uh, about 50% are, are vulnerable to the problem. And they actually built several working privilege exploits, exploits, two of them, to exploit this. One of them is not very interesting. It takes over the Google native clients. That's okay. But the other is really interesting. Uh, it basically, it uses these rowhammer induced bit flips to gain kernel privileges by running a program at the user level. So what the program does, uh, very quickly, I'll give you the key idea. If you want to really understand the security engineering details, you should definitely read this uh, blog post. They basically were able to hammer memory and induce bit flips in the page table entries of the program that points to the, same, the page table of the same program. Now, if you can, flip the right bits in your page table entry that points to your own page table, you can flip the write enable bit, let's say, 
Now you gain write enable access to your own page table, and you can do anything you want to your memory. Right? That's the idea. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that, because if you target a single bit out of 64 bytes, let's say, the probability of this attack being successful is very difficult. It's a probabilistic attack, but you can increase the probability of the attack by being more intelligent. So they sprayed the memory with page tables, and they did a lot of interesting stuff. Uh, but this is uh, the, the early work that built on the row hammer work to gain kernel privileges. And then people start drawing pictures like this. Is this the end of memory? We're going to talk more, uh, look at similar pictures like this. But I think my, uh, my favorite analogy, I always like things that are explained in a very crisp manner. I found this uh, on Twitter. Basically, somebody said it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming the neighbor's door until the vibrations, perturbations that you cause, magically open the door that you were after. Right? So if, you, if, this door, if this place was locked, now you know how to escape it. You keep banging on the walls and the vibrations magically open the door. Right? Well, good luck. <laughs> I'm not sure if the same failure mechanism occurs in this particular building, right? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go, uh, I'll be, this is for your benefit, you can take a look at it. Uh, this is really the literature that uh, I've collected on attacks uh, based on Rowhammer, and there, there's a lot, there's more to come. I'm not going to cover this, I'm going to give you some pictures later on, but all of these actually uh, in your slides. So people have built a lot of attacks, I don't know why my USB is so slow, so we need to figure out USB latencies, of course. So, okay, this is one of the uh, attacks over here. These folks from TU Graz in Austria, they basically built an attack where they could induce these bit flips remotely through the JavaScript in a remote server. So they said this, we gain unrestricted access to systems of website visitors. This is very interesting. Uh, you can read the paper as to how you do that. This is another interesting attack, one of my favorites. Basically, this is folks from uh, Fry University in Amsterdam. They basically tested uh, that you could do this in an Android phone. Uh, using ARM processors, and you know the operating system very well in the Android phone. And the operating system has predictable memory allocation patterns. What they did was they fooled, by, by, by doing memory allocations carefully in a user level program, they fooled the operating system to allocate a page table for that program in a location that they knew was vulnerable to Rowhammer. And over time, you can figure out slowly whether a location is vulnerable to Rowhammer. Once you fool the operating system to allocate your own page table to that location, you can hammer it and you can gain access. Basically, you take, it, uh, you take over the system. Right? And you can fool someone to download an app that, uh, that potentially does this. Right? Okay, and these are more recent. This is actually May, uh, May 3rd over here. Uh, people have looked at uh, using the GPUs to actually induce these attacks. Uh, and whenever you run a program that uses the WebGL interface, you could actually t uh, get compromised. And these folks uh, also looked at uh, inducing these Rowhammer attacks through the RDMA, remote DMA engine, on a remote machine again. And this is concurrent work again. Uh, this, is, this is also very recent. I think this is May 18th or so, yeah, May 10th. Okay, there are more security implications. This could be another security implication. If your computer is not safe, maybe this is one approach to keep it safe, right? I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> so we should talk about solutions. So one of the solutions will be intelligent memory controllers. So in the paper, we covered a lot of potential solutions. You should read the paper for more detail. Uh, there are a lot of issues, like make better DRAM chips, good luck. As you scale memory technology, you will run into these fundamental problems, and you run into even more problems. So this comes with a cost. You can make it reliable, but you need to isolate things, and that comes at a very high cost. So that goes directly against technology scaling. You don't want to do that necessarily if you're scaling in other dimensions. Refresh frequently, this may not be a good idea. We're trying to eliminate refresh, right? Uh, sophisticated ECC, error correcting codes. People are moving into error correction codes, but there are better solutions than error correction codes because error correction codes are very good at uh, uh, correcting random errors. If you don't know whether an error will happen, put error correction codes and they will correct those relatively well. But this is a very specific type of error. You could, do more, you could be more intelligent about correcting this. An access counter is basically, can you keep count of accesses to a given row and stop accesses? How do you do that? The complexity of this may be high. Okay, so this was a naive solution is throttle access to the same row, limit the access interval. This is not good for performance. Refresh more frequently. Our actually paper shows that if you want to get rid of every single error in the system, in every single chip that we've seen, you've got to increase the refresh rate by 7x. That's probably not a good idea because we want to get rid of refresh, not increase the refresh at all. Okay, uh, so this, was this, was, this is a solution that's employed by industry in existing. Because in the field you have a problem, right? In the field you have all these vulnerable chips. How do you fix the problem? Refreshing frequently is the solution actually. And I like putting Apple's uh, patch over here. They basically said uh, this issue was mitigated by increasing the memory refresh rates. 
They didn't say solved, they mitigate the problem. I believe they increase the refresh rate by 2x, maybe 4x under certain conditions. Uh, so they basically refresh the entire memory, even though this problem may be localized to a particular location. So this is not a good solution for that reason also. And other vendors release similar patches, and this is, I think, the reasonable solution to employ in the field. But if you had a patchable memory controller, it was, it, you could program it a little bit more, you could have come up with a much better solution perhaps, right? So what is the better solution? This was our solution, and I, th I still think this is a very good solution actually, because it's stateless. Uh, the idea is probabilistic. Basically, after you close a row, probabilistically, refresh the adjacent neighbors with very low probability, maybe five out of a thousand times, or one out of a thousand times, or if you want really, really high reliability, 10 out of a thousand times, right? Uh, this reliability guarantee with this number is much better than the reliability guarantee that you get from hard disks. And you only refresh the adjacent rows of the row that you're closing, only once in a while. And you don't even need to keep track of anything in this case, because you know which row you're closing, and you just need to know what are the adjacent rows, and you need to flip a coin. Uh, and you can vary the strength, as I said. So we tested it, you can read the paper, the slowdown uh, and the power overhead is very low. Uh, it's low cost and low complexity. Why isn't it employed in existing systems? Because the memory controller is not intelligent enough. The memory controller is a fixed entity. If we had a little bit more programmability, we could employ something like this. So how is it going to be, happen in the future? So uh, if you want to implement this in the DRAM chip, you could actually do this. Existing manufacturers are actually doing some of this. There is enough slack in timing parameters, which we're going to talk about in the last uh, topic. We have plenty of slack. The latencies are specified for the worst case operation, so the margins are very high. So actually, after you close a row, you have enough time. The memory controller doesn't issue a command for a long time because the latencies are specified that way. You could actually sneak in a refresh to the adjacent rows. And that's what's happening in existing DRAM chips. I'm not sure if this is a very reliable solution because we want to eliminate the slack as much as possible to reduce latencies. So we're going to talk about that. But this is one solution that the uh, manufacturers are employing today uh, in existing DRAM chips that are going forward. I believe a, more in, more better, a better solution is really doing this in the memory controller. Memory controller needs to know which rows are adjacent to each other in DRAM. This information is not exposed to the memory controller today. Internally, DRAM takes a row address and scrambles it a little bit. Most of the addresses are linear, but some of the, there's remapping of the rows that happen because of other reliability issues. For example, after a DRAM manufacturer tests DRAM and figures out, oh, there's a fault in this row, they don't want to throw out the chip because that's very costly, that affects their yield. So they have some spare rows and they remap internally this row address to that other spare row. And that information doesn't get exposed to the memory controller, so the memory controller doesn't know exactly which rows are adjacent to each other physically in the memory chip. So that information needs to be exposed, which means I need a better interface. We've been talking about better interfaces at the beginning of the lecture. We're going to talk about that at the end of the lecture. And you need an intelligent memory controller. So this is another need for the intelligent memory controller. So if you're interested in this, you can take a look at this paper. And I recently written a paper, which we're going to talk about a little bit more, uh, on the rope hammer problem and other problems that we may face going forward. So as I said, industry is writing papers about it too. They didn't talk about Rohammer. Rohammer was published at the same time this paper was published, actually. Uh, I mean, they were informed about Rohammer from us, so we actually collaborated with them quite a bit. Actually, if you see the Rohammer paper, there are Intel authors over there. Uh, but uh, uh, there are other issues as well, and uh, there, there needs to be solutions. So intelligent memory control is a good solution to the problem. And we actually know how to design some of these intelligent memory controllers. This is actually our infrastructure that I alluded to earlier. This is uh, our FPGA-based infrastructure where we can actually test memory chips. We built essentially a flash memory controller and the flash translation layer to understand the reliability and scalability issues with flash memory chips. Flash memory, if you look at it, flash memory has scaled down much faster than DRAM. As a result, it's seen a lot more issues. So whenever flash memory was introduced, it had a lot of errors to begin with. So you had to actually have an intelligent memory control to correct for those errors. And we actually looked at a lot of issues, and this inspired us to look into issues like Rohammer uh, in DRAM. So this, it's good to always build infrastructure and understand the problems really well, because that could actually enable you to do other infrastructures and discover other problems. And that's why uh, we, we, we were able to write this paper. And this discusses a lot of the research that we've done that's kind of summarized over here on uh, the flash memory uh, over here. So basically, the key takeaway is I think main memory needs intelligent controllers. We're going to talk a lot more about that. Uh, but I think we'll start tomorrow with understanding Rohammer a little bit. 
since I think I'm exactly on time because I started three minutes late. <laughs> Any burning questions before we part up? Yes. So excellent. That's an excellent question. What is the number of times you need to hammer the row, activate the row, and pre-charge before you actually induce the errors? So when we started testing, it was about 150 times, 150,000 times within a refresh interval. But that got reduced. The, the smart folks at Google, what they introduced was a double-sided row hammer. So instead of doing row hammer in a single row, you actually sandwich the row, and you do double-sided row hammer in adjacent rows, and they reduced a lot. And later, people have also optimized it. You can do it right now. It depends on the chip, of course, but you could do row hammer within 40,000 uh, accesses within a refresh interval, 40,000 or so. Yeah. Okay, one more. <laughs> Speak up. Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned this Google paper, right, that, uh, that Part also mentioned. Uh, it, certainly, I think prefetching could benefit a lot from machine learning, but I think this is a very ripe area to explore. It's uh, wide open. Even in memory controls, there's a lot more work to do. Yes, one more. I cannot hear you. Uh, to uh, change the frequency of hammering, yes, you said? Yeah, so I think uh, the, the, uh, which bits are vulnerable is a function of the hardware. So it doesn't change with the frequency of access, really. Yes? Was there any uh, real accident caused by a reported accident? I see. Really? Uh, well, I don't know, <laughs> first of all. Uh, but uh, all I can tell you is there's anecdotal evidence uh, that I've seen. Uh, where this actually may not be a security problem, but also a reliability problem as well. So there are some applications that actually bypass uh, caches because they keep some of the locks in part of memory. And if you're multi-threaded, you could be hammering those lo that location a lot. And as a result, you may actually get a wrong value. So that's all I can tell you in terms of a real application being affected. I believe real applications are being affected by this, but it's very hard to tell uh, also. So security issues, who knows, right? It's very hard to tell whether a security problem is being exploited. Uh, it may be. It's not an easy attack to exploit. It's probabilistic. But a lot of folks are actually also exploiting other microarchitectural attacks. So I, I believe we need to prevent it. That's a very good question, though. Any other questions? OK, I'll see you tomorrow. Enjoy the coffee break. <laughs>